So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Linda Hirschman to Politics and Prose. Hirschman is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Sisters in Law, How Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg Went to the Supreme Court and Changed the World. Her writing has appeared nationally, and she consults with and appears on Radio Lab's More Perfect podcasts. In her new book, Reckoning, Hirschman details the 50 year the 50 year struggle leading up to the Me Too movement of today and beyond. Despite setbacks such as the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, Hirschman demonstrates that legal, political, and cultural efforts, usually spearheaded by women of color, began paving the way for the takedown of abusers and harassers. Their work, Hirschman argues, has led to the media exposure of Harvey Weinstein's of the world in recent years, as well as a new wave of newly elected women of color who have ensured a reckoning in the halls of political power. Anna Holmes, writer and creator of Jezebel, writes, Reckoning is an important and fascinating history of the intersection of sex and power in the workplace and beyond. Hirschman's new book reveals aspects of American feminist history many of us did not know and provides important context around what we thought we did know. An inspiring, necessary, and perfectly timed work. Now please join me in welcoming Linda Hirschman. Hi, hi. It's so nice to be back at Politics and Prose. Um, sort of the, the only two things that matter in this world, right? Uh, so um, since you're all here at Politics and Prose, I'm going to make a wild guess that you already know how to read and probably do not require me to read to you. And if you will bear with me for just a moment, I promise not to impose on you too long, I would like to share with you just a little of my deathless prose. Tanya Harrell was just doing her job at a New Orleans McDonald's in 2017 when a guy she worked with shoved her into the bathroom, locked the door, and tried to rape her. The only thing the 20-year-old could do was cry and cry until she says he heard the manager calling, where were we? And he finally let me go. Harold wasn't going to get any help, she knew, because the last time she'd complained about a co-worker harassing her, her shift manager at McDonald's had suggested the touching was consensual. Sure enough, when she told the new manager about the attempted rape, her boss treated her story like it was nothing. Carol, who had left high school so she could work to pay for the medicine her grandmother needed, could not leave her low-wage job. One year later, on May 22, 2018, Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, an initiative founded by prominent women in the entertainment industry, announced it would be paying for Tanya Harrell and a dozen other low-wage workers around the country to sue McDonald's and its franchisees for harassment. After all, harassment had been recognized as a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act for more than 30 years. What a difference a year makes. No difference. What a difference 50 years make. And that's the story that I'm going to share with you a bit tonight. How could a year make such a difference? It could not. Tanya Harrell's story is an overnight success that took a half century to accomplish. And I have lived every day day of it myself. I graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1969. Five years later, Paulette Barnes, a black payroll clerk in the Environmental Protection Agency, filed a lawsuit against the federal government for violation of the Civil Rights Act, the law that forbids employment discrimination. Her boss had fired her because she would not have sex with him. Ridiculous, the trial court said. 
trial courts are so friendly when they're going to roll against you. That's not employment discrimination. He didn't fire you because you're a woman. He fired you because you're so delicious. And besides, the trial court said, sex isn't something we regulate with law. It's a private and personal thing. And whatever turns you on is good. He didn't actually say that, but he might as well have. Why that would why would sex be a subject for the law, even if it takes place at work, the trial court said. Barnes appealed. Okay? So when you you live here, so you probably know this. When you go from the DC District Court to the DC Court of Appeals, um, the panel is picked randomly in a heart-stopping experience for any serious lawyer. They turn a wheel and then they tell you who you get for your panel. Paulette Barnes hit the random selection jackpot. Two of the three judges on her panel were liberal lions. David Bazelon, for years the most influential judge on the D.C. Circuit. Spotswood W. Robinson III, the first African-American judge on any D.C. court. And the third judge was a Nixon appointee, George McKinnon, the plot thickens. Now, just bear with me. McKinnon's daughter, how many of you know who McKinnon's daughter is? Catherine McKinnon, right. Uh, McKinnon's daughter, Catherine, was a student at Yale Law School in, when Paulette Barnes appealed from her trial court defeat. And she, as Barnes was about to be argued in front of her dad, she was home for Christmas vacation. One day, while using the Lexus machine at her father's office, a stranger, honest to God, you can't make this stuff up, right? A stranger came up to her and said, I hear you've got a student paper that says something about sex at work. Can I see it? So Catherine McKinnon gave the stranger at the Lexus machine the only copy of her paper the sexual harassment of working women. Spotswood Robinson wrote the opinion. Don't you be ridiculous, he told the trial court, reversing. If Barnes weren't a woman, he wouldn't have demanded sex from her at all. She has to do more than a similarly good-looking man at the Environmental Protection Agency would have to do because, for the same lousy $28,000 a year because um, he has to be a clerk and she has to be a clerk plus a sex worker for the boss. So it's kind of unequal pay if you think about it. <laughs> And the Civil Rights Act says you can't pay someone who happens to be a woman less than a similar worker who happens to be a man. Bazelon was easy, but Judge Robinson even convinced Judge McKinnon that the behavior that Barnes complained about was illegal. The only thing Judge McKinnon disagreed with the other two liberal judges about was tagging the EPA. He concurred on that. He said, why should we, why should the employer be liable for his horny employees sexual acting out with their uh, employee in turn? God, the next thing you know, every disappointed workplace girlfriend would be suing the corporation. Does this sound familiar? Bosses should not be liable, Judge McKinnon suggested, unless they knew something and didn't act on it, didn't protect the employee, or unless they egged the guy on, which happens with larger frequency than you might expect. Nobody paid much attention to Judge McKinnon's separate opinion at the time because uh, he was just concurring, right? They had a liberal majority for finding everything in favor of the plaintiff, including the liability of the ultimate employer, something we lawyers call respondent superior or strict liability. Um, the key thing now was that after the Barnes decision, Barnes v. Castle, sexual harassment was a violation of the Civil Rights Act and not just, as a commentator suggested during the Clarence Thomas hearings, a down-home way of courting. I know, I do not make this stuff up. 43 years later, 
In an uncanny repeat of Paulette Barnes's story, Fox News chief Roger Ailes told his employee, Gretchen Carlson, that if she was unhappy with her job assignment, she should sleep with him. In fact, he said, you should have had sex with me a long time ago. You'd be good and better, and I'd be good and better. Now, I can promise you that uh, Roger Ailes would probably be good and better, but... <clears throat> Reader, she sued him. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> I love this part. <laughs> Just like Paulette Barnes did. Because of Catherine McKinnon, Yale Law student, and Paulette Barnes, brave black woman working for what was in today's dollars, $28,000 a year. She had a viable claim. It being 2017 and not 1974, however, Carlson went Barnes won better. She taped him. Steve Jobs has done more to emancipate women than Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> so great, right? 1974 establishes the right, and a half century later, bosses were still saying, wait a minute, why are they still saying it 43 years later? And that is the story of my book, why it took so long, and then why it changed so much in the astonishing story of the two years that followed the moment when Gretchen Carlson taped Roger Ailes soliciting sex from her on her iPhone. <sighs> I was just sitting at my desk minding my own business in December 2017. I was actually working on a book on abolition, which I hope to be back here talking about in a couple of years. Um, and my phone rang. And um, it was uh, charmed actress Alyssa Milano calling me. I love when this happens. <laughs> no, she's the one who sent out the tweet, what if every woman who's been harassed or abused tweeted slash, hashtag me too? She's the one who sent that tweet out in 2017. And um, she had other business with me. And as I was slobbering all over her on the phone for what she had done, I said to myself, looking at my stack of books about Frederick Douglass, I said to myself, Linda, this is the book you should be writing. Put everything down and write this story. Now, I am not going to tell you everything in Reckoning because you need to buy the book so that I can afford to buy food and stuff. But I will say this. You know the saying... It comes from Martin Luther King Jr., actually. The arc of history is long and it bends toward justice. You know that saying? So I would say the arc of history is long and it wiggles like a politician with a hacked cell phone. <laughs> but in America, any arc of history is going to involve three crucial forces. One is law. Tocqueville said in 1830 that sooner or later in America, every social problem ultimately comes to the courts. And after the appeals decision in Barnes's case, there were more cases. And finally, there was a Supreme Court case in 1986, which I just found out today. The wonderful Washington Post, your hometown newspaper, is going to publish my little essay in their history section on the 19th of June um, 2019, which is the anniversary of the time that the decision came down from the Supreme Court in Meritor versus Vinson. I want to tell you what happened in that case, Meritor versus Vinson, which was the ultimate case that went to the Supreme Court of the United States on, and was decided on June 19th, um, 1986. Uh, the little local bank had always seemed like an island of harmony and order in Michelle Vincent's childhood. Married at 15, she had dropped out of school only to see the marriage unravel. Oh, God, she needed that job. The moment Vincent finished her probationary period as a teller trainee, Sidney Taylor, now her supervisor at the bank, took her out to dinner and demanded that she have sex with him. 
That's how it started. Taylor made repeated demands for sexual favors, usually at the bank, both during and after business hours. She estimated that over the next several years, she had intercourse with him some 40 or 50 times. He abused her verbally and physically, including approximately a dozen incidents of what she described as rape. At least three of those episodes took place place in a bank vault. In addition, Taylor fondled her in front of the other employees, followed her into the women's restroom when she went there alone, and exposed himself to her. Taylor also, being sort of an equal opportunity guy, touched and fondled the other women employees of the bank. He exhibited pornographic images to the bank's female employees, making lewd suggestions. I actually didn't write this. Section. This comes from the opinion in Meritor versus Vinson. It is the statement of facts written by conservative Republican appointee to the Supreme Court of the United States, William Rehnquist. That's Rehnquist's rendition of what was done to Michelle Vinson. The Supreme Court ruled unanimously that what Sidney Taylor had done, if proven, violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was a hostile work environment. Sounds good, right? If an employer creates a hostile work environment, they violate the Civil Rights Act. Um, We went from one heroic black woman, Paulette Barnes, in D.C. in 1974 to the Supreme Court of the United States, just like Brown v. Board right? But there's a wiggly snake hidden in this arc of justice. The bank's not liable. Remember I said that conservative George McKinnon had said the employer shouldn't be liable in what we lawyers call strict liability? Now the Supreme Court said the bank's not liable. Five to four with, for those of you who are Hirschman fans and were here last time, the critical fifth vote being cast by... Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Banks not liable. Let the bank off the hook. How easy is it going to be to enforce the prohibitions against sexual harassment? Here's a secret conservatives have always known. How to count to five. The Supreme Court matters, and all you need are five Five years after Meritor versus Finson, Thurgood Marshall was dying and had to step down from the Supreme Court. And President George H.W. Bush nominated the chairman of the, you can't make this stuff up, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Clarence Thomas, to succeed Thurgood Marshall, or what we call from the sublime to the ridiculous. Miles away... In Oklahoma, Thomas's former assistant had been mulling whether she had an obligation to tell her story of her encounter with the would-be Supreme Court justice to the country. One month later, she introduced herself to the United States Senate. My name, she said, is Anita Faye Hill. And if the arc bent well, well, we would now sit looking at Justice Hill, right? She went to Yale Law School just like he did, but no. In 1991, the Senate was an old boys club, complete with the old farts walking around naked, shudder, in the Senate gym, and the man in charge of the Thomas hearings, now who would that be? Joe Biden, right. I knew I wasn't in some remote bookstore location. Joe Biden had promised his Senate buddy, John Danforth, on the uh, GOP side that the hearings would be very short and would not look into Thomas's personal life. And so they were. Well, so much for the law part, right? The employer's not liable, and the conservatives will dominate the Supreme Court of the United States probably for the rest of my lifetime. But there's another color in the rainbow, and that color is baby blue. The baby blue of Bill Clinton's baby blue eyes. 
after this is, I mean, this book practically wrote itself, I will say that. Don't tell my publisher, because, you know. Um, after Thomas was confirmed, the country saw the year of the woman, the first year of the woman, 1992, an electorate, articulate, women aroused and active. In, I was living in Chicago at that time. The women took over all of the courts. The Illinois courts are elected all of the courts and the sanitary district, which in Chicago is like where the patronage is. So it really matters a lot. 1992, the year of the woman and wait for it. They elected a Democrat to the White House. And two for the price of one, no less. Bill Clinton and his right-hand woman, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Bill Clinton lifted the gag order on abortions, and he appointed women to be both Surgeon General and Attorney General. He put Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court of the United States. The mostly conservative court kept putting limits on the action for sexual harassment. The standard is now severe and pervasive. Doesn't that sound like going to the dentist? Um, but it wasn't an all-out war, okay? The Supreme Court didn't get to the point that we're going to see very soon in this town this month. It didn't get worse. Bill Clinton was in the uh, White House. The Congress was Democratic briefly, and so it didn't get worse. There wasn't even another abortion case, actually, interestingly, in those years, right? So things kind of got a little better for women. People sort of forgot. We were happy, right, with Bader Ginsburg, you know, Janet Reno, Jocelyn Elder. We were sort of happy. And we forgot that the first time we met Bill Clinton, he was on television in the campaign of 1992 lying about sex with his wife nodding right along. We forgot that until 1998 when a brand new website the Drudge Report ran a story. I remember. I will always remember waking up, and it must have been in those days hearing it on the radio, um, and, and saying to myself, this is too bad to be true. This cannot be true. We have waited so long for a Democratic president, and we sacrificed so much in his moving the Democratic Party so far to the right, and now he's sleeping with an intern? I could not believe it. Could you believe it? Does anybody else remember that moment? And didn't you say, this can't be right. This is some crazy thing that Drudge has cooked up. But in fact, it was. Now, if you want to know my version of the Lewinsky affair, you're going to have to buy the book, or you could read the book review <laughs> in the New York Times, which, you know, is not so happy that I criticized Bill Clinton. <laughs> um or Gloria Stein, which I'm about to do again. Because uh, I'm like dauntless and also old. What can they do to me? They're a newspaper. <laughs> you could also buy the report of the gov of uh, the general independent counsel, Ken Starr. I promise you that Ken Starr's report is a lot more fun to read than that thing out there now. But what I'm interested in is how Clinton's sexual relationship with Miss Lewinsky, which he did have, footnote, bent the arc. In March, three months after the news of the affair broke, Gloria Steinem, who was the closest thing the feminist movement had to a spokesperson, published an op-ed in the New York Times opinion section in those days days before the wonderful Washington Post rose to its current eminence, the closest thing the liberal establishment had to an official publication. Even if everything Clinton is accused of were true, she wrote, feminists would still be right to resist his resignation or impeachment. Why aren't the critics of feminism attacking the environmentalists for not defending Monica Lewinsky, she asked. Since when... Wait for it. Gloria Steinem asked this question in the New York Times. Since when did the well-being of girls and women become feminism's special responsibility? Okay. I guess I didn't get the memo. I actually thought. <laughs> 
Right. So feminists like me who actually thought maybe the 50-year-old man in the Oval Office should not be taking up with an intern had nowhere to go. On the right, there was the patriarchal, smarmy, self-righteous, marriage for life, be fruitful and multiply, Ken Starr, who wants to go there. Right? We had lived there since the Monkeys jumped out of the trees in the African savanna thousands of years ago. On the left was the sexual revolution joy of sex crowd, which offered women the sexual state of nature populated by 50-year-old presidents and their 21-year-old interns. People like me had nowhere to go. But he's so good for the girls, movement feminists cried. We're going to get our reward. The second feminist and enabler-in-chief, President Hillary Clinton, would be our reward. Funniest thing, when she ran in 2008, her male colleagues in the Senate could not run fast enough to find someone who could beat her in the primary. And the story of those senators and their thought process is in my book, because I think this is part of what I call life in the aftermath of the collision with Bill Clinton. When Hillary Clinton ran again in 2016, a leaker at NBC sent a tape of her opponent, Donald Trump. Remember that? That was a happy day, right? Woke up, but this time we had Twitter. So, <laughs> so I opened my Twitter and there is the Access Hollywood tape, which someone leaked to the aforementioned Washington Post. I was, I had theater tickets that night. I was actually late. I could not put it down, right? You know, they crashed the server at the Washington Post. I could not put it down. Two days later, Trump showed up at the debate with a full cheering section of Bill's targets. Jennifer Flowers, who Clinton lied about on national TV, Paula Jones, who sued him for harassment at work, Kathleen Willey, who accused him of sexual assault, and Juanita Broderick, who said the R word, rape. In that debate, Hillary never stood a chance. The third strand of our rope of fate is what I'll call culture, including roughly media, literature, and all the unofficial ways in which we go around deciding what's right and wrong outside of a courthouse or the halls of Congress. So let's look at the culture. In 1970, New York Magazine issued its first edition of Ms. Magazine as a regular pullout from the New York Magazine issued that. 1980, 20th Century Fox released 9 to 5 with its vengeful, victorious, working women heroines who tied their boss, remember, to a garage door opener and kept him a prisoner while they enacted all of the reforms in the workplace, pictures on the wall, daycare center, flex time, God knows, right? That was the 70s and early 80s. In 1986, Newsweek magazine published an article about the reward to feminism. Feminists, here's your reward. Single women over 40 were more likely to be killed by a terrorist than to find a husband. In 1987, Paramount Pictures released Fatal Attraction. In Fatal Attraction, Michael Douglas plays a rising star at a New York law firm with a saintly stay-at-home wife. One fatal day, he meets, wait for it, the androgynously named Alex, already a red flag, a, worst of all, a book editor. She was a book editor. How dangerous is that? Single, childless, and she turns into the terrorist Newsweek had warned women about. <laughs> the movie ends when the married man shoots her to death, just as she's about, Alex the single, childless, New York book editor, is about to knife his <laughs> wife to death. I... <laughs> Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. That's right. And I lived through all of this. I just want to be sure you know this. I was a brunette when this started. <laughs> Susan Faludi noticed a change in the weather and gave it a name. Backlash, she called it. It seemed like the feminist movement might never 
recover. And then in 2003, a girl from Queens, the redoubtable Jessica Valenti, took a woman's studies course and decided to share her thoughts online. And feministing the website was born. New media technology, always dangerous. Just ask Martin Luther. Thank you, Gutenberg. Just ask Abraham Lincoln. I was working on a book on abolition when I set it aside. Abolition went forward on the wheels of the steam-powered printing press and cheap, industrially produced paper made, ironically, of cotton. Those technological changes drove the abolitionist movement. Ten years after Jessica took to the Internet, University of North Carolina undergraduate and rape survivor Andrea Pino was sitting in her women's studies class. There's a through line here, right? Catherine McKinnon writes it. She can't get anybody to hire her. It is a samistat, kind of an underground McKinnon, you know, secret society of people who read McKinnon in their women's studies classes, and they're radicalized by it. She's like Socrates, right? They made her drink the hemlock. No tenure, that's the equivalent to hemlock <laughs> in the world I live in. And her, her words kept penetrating, and in 2013, they reached Andrea Pino, and um, she learned that colleges which take federal funds are covered by a law called Title IX, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. And rape on campus was revived on the University of North Carolina campus with the new media technology and feminism's slow penetration of the academy and the legal profession. There was a lot of feminist gunpowder lying around. And then, as they say on Twitter, boom, the dam broke. Do I have a scoop for you? I love this story. I absolutely love this story, being a journalist of sorts myself. So Gretchen Carlson sues Roger Ailes, right? And the Murdochs, who run Fox News, weren't crazy about Ailes at that moment. So they hired a law firm to look into Ailes, you know, incredibly disgusting behavior, and uh, they fire him. And they pay Gretchen Carlson $30 million. And then, be still my heart, he dies. <laughs> I know I am not going to heaven. I know that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> And women were coming out of the woodwork to her lawyer, right? So uh, I learned this from Gretchen Carlson's lawyer, who's a real trip, Nancy Erica Smith. She's a total hoot. So Nancy Erica Smith said to me, after the Gretchen Carlson thing went public, she was inundated with other people that Roger Ailes had abused. And she was so busy with Gretchen Carlson's case that she didn't have time to take them all. So she sent them to a journalist. And the journalists that to tell their story, right? She is so smart, Nancy Erica Smith, to create an environment in which her claim against Roger Ailes would, you know, like get a sympathetic hearing. So the, the journalist is a new, was working at New York Magazine at the time. He's now at Vanity Fair. And his name is Gabriel Sherman. And Gabriel Sherman had written a biography of Roger Ailes called, appropriately, The Loudest Voice in the Room. And so Nancy Erica Smith knew that Sherman would be sympathetic if she sent these other accusers to Sherman. So day after day, Sherman is breaking scoops in New York Magazine about the other sex scandals surrounding Roger Ailes. Remember, this is 2016, before the Me Too movement, right? So, like, he was getting fantastic scoops. And I read that it was driving the editor in chief of the New York Times, Dean Baquet, insane, right? That this like upstart New York magazine place was getting all these fabulous scripts. It was driving him insane. Jesus or something, he said. I'm not sure exactly what he said. There has to be another boss whose story we could break. 
There has to be another boss's story the New York Times could break. And if you're thinking about jolly old men who can't keep their pants zipped, one name stands out. His name was Harvey Weinstein. The Times and The New Yorker and The Hollywood Reporter had been after him for years. Everybody knew about Harvey Weinstein. They just couldn't get any one of his victims to go on the record so they could tell the story. So Beck Hay calls in his attack dog political reporter, Jody Cantor, who was like legendary for her energy and determination. And she asked for the newbie, Megan Toohey, who had just come to the Times to work with her. Megan Toohey has a very honorable feminist background from her early days in the journalism business. And on October 5th, 2017, readers clicked on the New York Times to see this headline. Harvey Weinstein paid off sexual harassment accusers for decades. Alyssa Milano wondered aloud on Twitter what would happen if every woman who had been harassed or assaulted tweeted, me too. And here's what happened. <laughs> um, okay, after Weinstein, Andy Signore, Senior Vice President of Content at DeFi Media, Roy Price, head of Amazon Studios, Chris Savino, creator and showrunner of Nickelodeon's The Loud House, Robert Scoble, tech blogger, Lark Hart Steele, editorial director of Vox Media, John Besh, restaurateur, Terry Richardson, fashion photographer, Leon Weasel's here, this is a particular favorite of mine, former editor of The New Republic, Steve Jurvetson, venture capitalist, Knight Landisman, publisher of Art Forum, Rick Najera, director of CBS's Diversity Showcase, Mark Halperin, M NBC News and MSNBC contributor and co-author of Game Change, Kurt Webster, music publisher, Kevin Spacey, actor, Hamilton Fish, president and publisher of The New Republic, Andy Dick, actor, and that was just the first month. It's a perfect story, right? It's a perfect story. Boy meets girl, Catherine McKinnon figures it all out for you. Boy loses girl, Bill Clinton drives right at the feminist movement and the movement swerves. Boy and girl find each other again, feminists rediscover their McKinnon, and a new generation of journalists and lawyers connect over the new media. The new movement follows the three Hirschman rules for movement success. Take the moral high ground, look after your interests, and stay in touch. Okay, there are no guarantees. When Brett Kavanaugh won the Scary White Man contest in October 2018, you remember that, right? Who's the scariest white man in the Senate hearing room? It was kind of close between uh, Kavanaugh and Lindsey Graham, but... Pundits rushed to the microphone. You may not remember this, but I, of course keep all grudges, to proclaim the end of Me Too and that the Democratic Party was going down in the midterm election of 2018. And if you read your reckoning, you'll see exactly which white male pundit said that in the brief period after the hearing in October and before the first polls started coming out, I held my breath. Would the arc of history wiggle away again? It did not. The election, the midterm election of 2018 was the closest thing we have to a referendum on the Me Too movement. It will slow. There will be losses. It, there always is. Like a wiggles like a politician with a hack cell phone. But I have lived the life of a movement to make the world a better place for people less powerful than I am. And I have my epitaph. I got it from Tanya Harrell. After I finished interviewing her, I asked her the question I always ask my sources at the end of an interview. 
because I cannot possibly, even I cannot possibly think of everything. And if I've done my job, they've learned to trust me with their story. So I said to Tanya Harrell, maybe she was when I interviewed her, 20, just above the minimum wage, black plaintiff in the McDonald's case. I said to her, what else do you want to tell me? And Tanya Harrell looked at the privileged white journalist who had the effrontery to think she could tell Tanya's story. And she said to me, I love you. I'm going to put it on my tombstone. Thank you. So, questions, questions you have, ha- yes. Oh, go to the mic. Line up at the mic. Look, I'm a law professor. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> We're going to have a Socratic dialogue, and you're going to feel incredibly stupid at the end of it. Just go to the microphones. Yes. How much do you think the Me Too movement was... Um, uh, continued to get so much force behind it as a reaction to Trump's sexism? I think that the, uh, I think that Trump's sexism played an important role in the last, God, time goes so fast when you're having fun, what is two and a half years? Okay, I think it played an important role. Um, it started with Megyn Kelly's question of him at the first Republican primary debate. So the issue of how he treats women has been on the table since the beginning of his candidacy. And it, of course, reached a high point at the Access Hollywood tape. A lot of the women's uh, march the pink pussy hat march right after the inauguration. You know, the one where people, lots of people actually came to Washington and marched um, and all over the world um, was fueled by the anger and, and indignation of the election of the man who had said those things about women. After Clarence Thomas was confirmed, there was a wave of sympathy and support for Anita Hill. So women seem to mobilize a little tiredly. I'm hoping that the election of 2018 is a change from that. But I absolutely think that part of this, I know it. I, you know, I'm a human being. I talk to my girlfriends and my sources in the um, book, making the book. And I heard all the time the anger and indignation that had fueled the movement. And speaking of anger, we have in our very number, Soraya Chamali, who wrote the book, Madness Becomes Her, about women and anger. So if you have any money left after you purchase Reckoning, <laughs> she, her book and mine relate very clearly, right? She's talking about the um, psychological and emotional and and more of the private story of women's response. But since you asked, I want to recommend that book as well. Um, How do you anticipate um, the Me Too movement affecting the 2020 primary and election, especially with all of the women candidates that we have? uh, Right. So, newsflash, I've been thinking about that a lot. (laughs) Um, I, it's very, okay, so I'm going to follow my friend and the absolute heir of my political life, Rebecca Traster, in this and say, we don't know. We do not know what's going to happen in the primary. And anybody who tells you that they know and that accordingly the party's over, so to speak, are wrong. We do not know. On the other hand, I am Cassandra. You may remember Cassandra, the princess who could see the future, but no one would believe her, was actually killed by a jealous wife after she warned the husband not to go into the palace. You may remember Cassandra. So uh, I will tell you what I see, which is I think that the... 
it is unfortunate that the old white man candidate in the Democratic primary has a long history of paternalistic and um, bizarrely uncaring, a combination of both lovingly paternalistic and bizarrely uncaring. Of course, you know, I had a dad in the 50s, so this is not completely unfamiliar to me. Um, Behavior. Because what it does is it puts on the table the real conflict between the wants, needs, and desires of the aroused female and feminist electorate and this very indigestible guy. Okay, now I will say, I would vote for this glass of water before, okay. But, um, and being Cassandra, I notice stuff, right? Like the horse at the gates of Troy doesn't really look that much like a gift. Um, (laughs) Elizabeth Warren is creeping up. If it gets to be a head-on-head confrontation between Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren, then you are going to see a, uh, a manifestation in the Democratic primary of the culture wars that I chronicle in the book. So I would love to write about that. I'm just like, you know, once I see something, I just make my people that I write for insane pitching them endlessly because I just feel like I have to say it. So you've, but you've, you've done a good thing here, which I've now said it. So maybe I can take the weekend off. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. It's coming now. It's coming. You're yes, sir. (laughs) Okay. Um, I think you might be a little bit wrong about what you said about Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I think Joe is going to end up endorsing a whole lot of what Elizabeth Warren is asserting. But that's be that as it may, that's not the question I wanted to to ask. I'd like to I'd like your insight on why the Access Hollywood tape didn't move the needle. Um, Okay. I okay. think, now I think, I, may I? I, uh, I think it was know. because, well, <laughs> I, I, I think it was because the media censored the P word. Okay, now that's what I think. Ah, uh, okay, well, that's um, interesting. I think may they should have played yeah. it. Okay, I've heard your yeah. position now, so yeah. let me answer the question. Yeah. Um, this is actually sort of an interesting question, which is um, why, so, and we knew it right away. Because the uh, the needle did not move immediately, and it didn't move in the two or three critical days yeah. at, as people got to digest it. So I think that um, I think that Donald Trump was already a known quantity as an abusive, woman hating, and woman mistreating person. So. The Access Hollywood tape was not news to people. And um, usually when something like that comes out, it has traction because it, it's incoherent. It makes you, it will change the needle if it changes your mind. But people who supported him already knew what he was like. So this was not news. The, uh, uh, the other thing that I think is true has to do with a collateral issue, which is, Why do white women vote for someone who would speak about them that way? And uh, there are two answers to that. One is that they white women get a share of the surplus that white men generate if they make an alliance with a white man. Let's call it marriage. They get a surplus of what the white husband generates. It isn't as much as they would get if they were fully empowered in the society. But sometimes it's the best they can hope for and sometimes it seems like enough to them because nobody has ever made them, uh, no one has ever been able to have them understand that they should have higher hopes. So that's a piece of it. That's a a very important piece of it. Um, The other thing is 
you're wearing a T-shirt that says Black Lives Matter. And I was working on a book about abolition, and I still have it very much in my mind. We are the heirs of the worst social institution in Western history, with the possible exception of the Holocaust, chattel slavery. And there's a wonderful book called Deep Roots, which actually looked at how people voted in 2016. And they found that people voted in 2016 for Trump the most heavily in counties that had the most slavery in 1860. So even in the South, if you were in the slave part of North Carolina, you were much more likely. I mean, most of these people came to America long after the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's very interesting. But you cannot think about American politics without thinking about slavery and uh, the and, and the wicked inheritance of slavery, which is so brilliantly chronicled in the very careful social science labor that the authors of Deep Roots did. Next person. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Good evening. Uh, I think I'd like you to see if you can connect the dots. Um, Me Too, Backlash, and Heather McDonald. The Manhattan Institute person? Heather McDonald. She's a uh, right-wing... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Commentator. Yeah. I can't do that. She okay. You want to know about whether you should bring the horse into the city? That I can do. Oh come on, sir. Um, so there's a lot of attention to the Supreme Court, but the lower courts are being sacked with sort of reactionary oh, yeah. Federalist Society yeah. judges. Yeah. Uh, at a pretty alarming rate. Yeah and it's not getting as much attention. Um, I'm just sort of wondering your take on how that will impact women's rights moving forward, given that a lot of um, the rights have gone through the legal system and rulings, as you were talking about earlier. So now we have a generation of judges who may have differing views. And I went to law school with some of those Federalist Society Republican life tenured federal judges that were appointed earlier in the process. And um, I promise you it's bad. Um, Okay. Uh, This will not surprise. I have been criticized for this, but I'm okay with it. I'm a radical. And accordingly, I would say, pack the courts. Not just pack the court, pack the courts, including the lower courts. There is no constitutional reason why the courts have to be the size that they are, and they have been changed inside and redistributed over even the years that I was practicing law. So you could increase the size of the lower courts. You could divide the Ninth Circuit into two. There are many things that you can do to change that outcome. I read somewhere, and I cannot just save my life remember where it was. Maybe one of you knows who said this. They said, Mitch McConnell unpacked the court. When Antonin Scalia died, right? I predicted this in the Washington Post, actually. Um, uh, see your earlier reference to Greek goddess who sees the future. And, um, and he would not replace, he would not let Barack Obama fulfill that seat. So Mitch McConnell unpacked the Supreme Court. And the Republicans in Congress, by slow walking the Obama appointments to the lower courts, also in some sense unpacked the court. So I would say pack the court until there isn't a suitcase left at the Toomey store. It is it is the Democrats don't bring a knife to a gunfight. They bring a teacup to a gunfight. This is... A, a movement that has been building since uh, William Buckley called the meeting in his living room in 1955. So this is not like, and the Federalist Society dates back to 19, 19, 1982, I think it is. Yes, Federalist Society dates back to 1982. They have been trying to reshape the court for, what is that, uh, 39, 38 years, okay? Take the Senate, take the White House, and then take the courts. Thank you for asking. That's a great question. We have time for a couple more questions. Great. 
Yeah. Uh, one okay, two, this is the last male person that's going to ask me a question. I just want you to know that. You're good. I'm glad you're asking a question. Okay. My, my question for you, one or, it's one or two part, is one, in terms of the rapidity of public awareness after Weinstein, is this u very unique in American social change reform movements? That's the first. Ooh, that's and, a good question. And the second is... Given that this has been illegal or barred and there have been lawsuits for 40 years, um, how is the change in the upper tiers of, you know, corporate media where the, you know, the Times had the list of the 121 people who fell, uh, and the, but many of the people filing suit are well-heeled, noted professionals with access to lawyers. How is, so one, how rapid is it and how does it compare to other social movement okay. awareness things, including gay rights, et cetera? And B, how is this going to get down into the everyday interactions of men, supervisors, and men and women in the workplace? Okay. Two good questions. Okay. So second question first, because it's easier. <laughs> um, you know, most change in a capitalist society is top down. Okay. So let's stop beating up on the rich white actresses and Gretchen Carlson who had enough money to do this. She could do it without being as courageous as the uh, original plaintiffs who were women of, poor women of color. She could do it because she was completely financially secure for the rest of her life. Okay. So um, we need people who are in powerful positions to, to act. Okay, there, you know, the Howard Law School at Washington, D.C., right, the jewel of Washington, D.C., produced a generation of black lawyers who were lawyers and they weren't factory workers. And they changed the world for the civil rights movement, so the racial civil rights movement. So don't be quick to condemn powerful, educated. Yeah, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ether here. They're making a movie or something, so maybe it'll be on YouTube. <laughs> Um, the rich white actresses did a smart thing, which is they founded the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, where and they raised a bunch of money on uh, that money raising place. And um, uh, what is it called? Um, Change dot org or something. Anyway, uh, but. Uh, they're using that. And then they did a really brilliant thing, which is they brought in Robbie Kaplan, my absolute favorite lawyer in America, who represented E.D. Windsor in the just in case you think that things are unrelated in the gay marriage case, the Doma case. Um, they brought in Robbie Kaplan and she told them to use a Washington institution, the National Women's Law Center, to administer the money that they had raised. So they have good professional activists who have been working on behalf of women since the 70s, running it, and they are doing a very good job um, uh, starting to bringing together dozens of cases against McDonald's, lots of publicity and social pressure on McDonald's. They, you know, unions are on their backs now, so the SEIU cannot organize these workers, but um, they are doing a bank shot at McDonald's and representing these women very well. So I want to shout out to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, Robbie Kaplan, and the National Women's Law Center. Um, how fast do things change? I think the lesson of my book is that not very fast, okay? You became aware of it. It's like I have a piece coming out on the Los Angeles Times day after tomorrow um, about rapid versus slow social change Stonewall, it's the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, right? Stonewall seemed like an eruption, just like Me Too did. But that's not true. The gases had been gathering under the earth for decades before Stonewall. And um, maybe you can get the LA Times online and read in more detail. And um, the same thing here. So that's one thing. The second thing is, so it's never very fast, the second thing is that it takes the dedicated labor of generations of activists to make it happen. We must not say to the the women of Chapter 8, Feminism Reborn, Jessica Valenti, Rebecca Traster, Irin Carmon, Suraya Chamali, we must not say to them, you didn't matter, nothing mattered until October 10th, 2017. That's just not true. So we want to honor their service. 
it is the fact, it is a fact that technology and geography matter. So Stonewall, there were two riots in California and LA and in San Francisco in the five years before Stonewall. Okay, because the uh, people started raiding the gay balls and stuff, and the gay people were already, it was the 60s, standing up. But it didn't become Stonewall. And part of that is because of the geography of Greenwich Village. People live very close together. They were out on the stoops. They were hanging out. One of the things I learned since I moved to New York is you have to be so careful before you go out because somebody on the street for sure is going to comment on your outfit. There's a lot of street life in New York. York were densely packed and particularly in that part of New York and that is absolutely in the causal chain for Stonewall. So it is true that it matters. The internet mattered but you cannot make a movement without meeting. Indivisible, the Women's March, fine. You want to gather a hundred million people in the streets of cities for one day? The internet. You want to win the election of 2018, indivisible. We had an indivisible chapter in Arizona where I live in the winter and um, we flipped that Senate seat, right? Yeah, yay, right, right. We flipped that seat. And the reason was not the, may they rest in peace, the Arizona Democratic Party. It was indivisible. And they met. I was there. They met. They physically met. I had one of the meetings in my living room. They had parties where you went and wrote postcards to your uh, congressmen and stuff and senators. We saw each other in each other's yards. It was heavily run by women. And so there was food. (laughs) There was, right? This is the way you make a movement. So the internet can't do it alone, but the internet does a lot, just like movable type and the steam press. So maybe one more question. So I have a question about the role of black women in the movement. Um, I was reading a little bit of your book and you talk about that. But in particular, there is tension now between the black women and the white women in this movement. So I have a question about that. And then also the role of just the younger generation uh, and how that is affected. So this is my pleasure to answer this question. And you don't know it, but this is one of my oldest friends on this earth here. Uh, I think that it's a false conflict between white women and black women. And I'm always suspicious when people try to drive a wedge into a movement for social change. Because if you look deeply in who is it that's hawking that narrative, it's often the oppressors and the people who want to resist change. It would be a mistake for white women to think, and the ones that I talk to for my book do not think, that they can go forward without the robust alliance with black women. The first plaintiff, Paulette Barnes, was a black woman. The second plaintiff, Sandra Bundy, was a black woman. The woman who went to the Supreme Court of the United States, Michelle Vincent, was a black woman. The person who tweeted out Me Too in 2011 was a black woman. You got to be nuts to try to make a movement without the most powerful, courageous allies that you could hope for. And they are correctly resentful at the white women who will sell them out to the Republican Party for a little of the surplus that the white husbands generate, okay? They're correctly resentful. I was a union side labor lawyer in another life, and we used to call the people who crossed the picket line scabs. Those women are scabs. And if you're a black woman who for $28,000 a year in today's dollars brings the lawsuit, you don't want to see them voting for Donald Trump. And so they have a reason to be resentful. But I have good news, which is, I hate to end on bad news. I have good news, two pieces of good news. One is the uh, electorate in 2018, which has now been looked at by real social science election data people, not just the crap stuff you read. Okay, there's actual academic analysis from big data. Um, and those white women, white women broke in 2018 at least 50-50. 
And if you can break white women 50-50, you can win elections in America. You absolutely can. So that's good news. It's down from 2016 when it was roughly 52-48, and it's down from 2012, okay? So the white women's fealty to the Republican Party is slowly inching down, doesn't need to go too low, right? Because uh, there are uh, our allies, people of color, uh, voting for everybody's interest. The second piece of good news, and I want to leave you with this. I was on the podcast Slow Burn, okay, on the episode about the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. And I said my usual moderate things about it that I have been saying since 1998, unlike most of Monica Lewinsky's newfound friends. And I opened my Twitter feed the next day, and there was a DM, a direct message from a a young uh, journalist, Irene Carmon, who was the one who broke the Charlie Rose scandal. Um, And the message said, I was so happy when I turned on the radio and heard your voice of fierce integrity. They are our heirs, and they are so radical and so um, clever and so productive and so unified that I think the um, it's not, they're younger than my own daughter, so it's not the next generation exactly. It's like a generation and a half down. Women in their late 20s, 30s, and early 40s are, read about them in Chapter 8, they're feminism reborn. I am just buoyed up by their existence. Thank you.